Um, so it's a, it's a distinct pleasure to have Albert visit us today. Um, we know each other for quite a long time, over 10 years, I guess. Um, so uh, Albert was um, did his uh, degree at Georgia Tech, where he worked on computational storytelling before language and vision or, or any of these topics were actually popular. Um, so he was at the roots of this, uh, initially doing some really interesting work with symbolic ways of modeling stories and so on. Um, and then uh, he came and was a, a postdoc with me for about half a year before he was very promptly promoted and was a, a research scientist and had his own group at Disney that was doing uh, sort of topics of this nature. And then uh, after Disney, he um, went to Baidu, where he was a research scientist for a little while, and then eventually um, ended up in Nanyang, where he is an associate professor now, has gotten a number of uh, distinct awards. And uh, it's a real pleasure to have you here. Uh, so please. Thank you so much, Mian, and uh, for all the years and the mentorship and everything. Um, so uh, I'm very happy to have the opportunity here today talk to you about my own research in the domain of multimodal, in particular uh, vision and language research, uh, with those gigantic pre-trained language models. I'm sorry, I have a little problem with my voice today, so I cannot really talk very loudly. Um, so if you cannot hear me, maybe in the back, uh, please feel free to move to the front. Um, so um, I'm sure in the past few years, for a few months, you have been, I'm poor, but you have been hearing about this too much, like everybody is telling you, like how fast you know the sizes of those language models grow and how good they are and how much training data they have and how many states there are results they have achieved. So if anyone were to tell you this again, it would be bored to death. So I wouldn't do that, um, except just you know show you some of the names, some of these award that gets refreshed every week, if not every day. Um, so you know, but maybe there is. One thing that is still of interest to you, um, which is that you know, still people disagree with um, how do we think about those large language models and what is their relation uh, with respect to um, you know uh, AGI or maybe strong AI things like that. Right? If you go on Twitter, you hear really two schools of thoughts, uh, two camps of people. Um, the proponents uh, correctly point out that. These models have broad competence, meaning they are able to accomplish a lot of different tasks in many different domains. Right? They're acing uh, some tests that are designed for humans, like the American AP test, some medical tests, some uh, American bar exam, or some business school essay writing um, stuff. Right? So, which are placed some things that are do very well. Um, they have unparalleled mastery of natural language. Um, this is holding directly the Microsoft paper on sparks of AGI. And it, some people say, you know, there are, if not already AGI, they have sparks of AGI. Um, and the other school of people uh, also try to find out that those models sometimes give you like really silly mistakes. Um, they, have, they have severe hallucination. Like they make up things like, you know, like crazy. Um, they cannot do simple mathematics. Um, and Yen Lekeng famously pointed out or uh, proposed that nobody will be interested uh, in those models in five years' time, which is kind of a radical statement. But um, there really seems to be this divide, right? How do we understand those arguments? Uh, are they, is one of the position right or are, both, are they both right? Or is there any? Kind of middle ground to understand um, where they're coming from. So um, I think the difficulty in understanding the LLMs stems from the fact that they are uh, a type of general intelligence. They actually can do a broad range of tasks in a broad range of domains. Um, but this type of intelligence is really different from the human intelligence that we have. And so far, it is. The only type of general intelligence that we are familiar with is the human intelligence. So whenever we talk about general intelligence, we make references and we compare to human intelligence um, often subconsciously. Right? We're not even aware necessarily we're making those references. Um, 
better than and that made it really hard to understand um, uh, these uh, machine uh, general intelligence models. Right? So we are probably making, uh, thinking in anthropomorphic terms, uh, even when we're not necessarily aware of them. For example, um, we, when we judge people, uh, we often use those correlations. For example, uh, if, if someone can talk really eloquent, they can uh, master the English language, they can use big words correctly. And you would typically think that that is a smart person. And a smart person can probably do simple mathematics. A smart person can tell what is fake, what is real. And that those are really just correlations, but they just happen so you know, frequently in humans that we take those for granted. But when we try to apply these things to machines, we get surprised. We're like, how do you do that? When you're so good at this, but so poor in other things, right? So um, I'm not saying that all, all types of anthropomorphic thinking is bad. In fact, I'm gonna make some anthropomorphic arguments myself in this talk. Um, but what I'm saying is that when it's like in mathematics, you wanted to, it's okay to make assumptions, but you wanted to make the assumptions explicit so you know what assumptions you're making. Like it's okay to think in anthropomorphic terms because I think there are some still some similarities between all, all types of intelligence, uh, but it is the implicit type of anthropomorphic thinking that is sometimes a problem. Okay. So what is the major difference, the, the most significant difference? Obviously, there are many, many differences between the LLMs and human intelligence, uh, but I would argue that. The, the most uh, prominent difference is how much memorization uh, they are capable of. Like humans are special in the sense that we memorize so little that we generalize so much so well. And to the so much so that the term memorization almost becomes a negative term in Russian language. Right? So uh, it becomes like the opposite of generalization. But I think these models show like actually memorization can be helpful in many ways. And without memorizing at least some things, you cannot really generalize. And these models are built of, of course, digital circuits. And they have huge bandwidth. They can read billions of tokens within a few hours uh, that humans wouldn't even complete in a lifetime. Right? So, um, by utilizing those things, these models have read so much, and memorized so much, and once they memorize, they don't forget. And, um, and you could use that to compensate for the lack of reason or quote unquote, understand. For example, if I ask you to do a three digit multiplication, 927 multiplied by 161, you know, you can do that with a sheet of paper and a pen, um, take a few minutes and you can solve that. But the machine, if, if they have seen this in their training data, they can just give you the answer, right? And on the other hand, if it's never seen uh, this calculation in the training data, then maybe it wouldn't be able to give you the right answer. Right? So that's, some, that's why I think some of the reasons why sometimes you put in some numbers, Give you a correct answer, you change the input a little bit, then it's going to give you a wrong, wrong answer, right? So, what we observe is you have some intermittent performance. Um, the, the prompts are brittle. So if you change the wording of the prompt, sometimes it gives you different answers, right? So, that is at least consistent with the hypothesis that those LLMs are doing memory assisted or memory based generalization. I'm not saying all they do is to memorize. But I'm saying is their generalization to a large extent is helped or assisted by their ability to really memorize a lot. And, uh, you know, we have some recent really interesting findings that the, uh, if you ask ChatGPT or GPT-4 to tell a joke, um, they mostly rehash one of 25 jokes to memorize. Um, there's some evidence for that. Um, that when it sees a compositional problem, like a arithmetic problem, 
um, it tends to try to reuse the things that the sub problems that has seen in the training phase. So there's some, you know, suggestive evidence that a lot of the generation capabilities of these models are based on some form of memorization, and which is not all that. Right? So, um, so, so the analogy that I have for these models is that there are a gigantic treasure box with a lot of treasure gold in it. Uh, but it's kind of locked and you need the right key you know, to open it um, with the right key. If you can open it, it can help you do a lot of things, uh, it can help you solve all the problems. Uh, on the other hand, if you, if you don't find the right keys, then they kind of don't work. Um, and uh, in the past, we have found many keys, uh, you know, chain of thought prompting um, is one example. Uh, let's think step by step, I think is the most prominent example. It's really the magic phrase, like open sesame. Once you say that phrase, then suddenly your performance goes up like 30, 50%. And if you don't say that, it's day and night. Um, there are also ways to sort of tune the models to uh, modify the weights of these models, which can also work as key, such as uh, instruction tuning that we already know of. Um, but the recent paper shows that, you know, uh, if you only do instruction tuning using kind of a smaller model, um, that is not as powerful as you know the 170, uh, 137 billion model or uh, the uh, you know one trillion uh, GPT-4 model. Um, that uh, the the effect you can you can kind of simulate the surface forms. You can sound confident, but the content is kind of not there. Um, so. You know, using my analogy, the content of the treasure box is not easily simulated. Um, all those things work as keys rather than like what's what's really in the box, if that makes sense. So that's my you know personal read of these models. Uh, it is a hypothesis, a speculation. I'm not saying that it's like definitely provenly have, have been proven correct, uh, but I personally find them to be a to, to be a useful way to think about things. And, um, today, I want to talk to you uh, about some things, some of the keys that we have found um, that we think can unlock some really important multi-model capabilities um, or uh, NLP capabilities or uh, in, in novel domains, uh, which I, I think are, are pretty interesting. So uh, my research interest is in multi-model, uh, specifically uh, vision and language, and we have worked on um, Bunch of things over the years. Um, Video GPT, uh, which is, I think, one of the earliest works that try to use LLMs for uh, vision and language tasks. Um, back in, like, this was uh, posted on archive in February 2021. Um, uh, we didn't even have uh, chat, we didn't have chat GPT or Bikuna or anything like that. So we took GPT 2 and we uh, use that as an initialization and we fine tune those parameters and uh, not going into too much details, uh, but it's, it's one of the early work that, you know, worked okay at that time. Um, I was recently involved in this instruct blip work uh, that basically tried to perform instruction tuning on the blip v2 model. Um, basically we take some existing uh, vision language data sets and we modify them to be in this instruction format. So the yellows are the data set we use to train and the white are the data set we use for validation and test. Uh, those are head out data sets. And uh, the blue v 2 model is uh, basically a, a small network which we call the Q-former or query transformer, um, which connects two big pieces of uh, pre-trained networks. One is an image encoder, the other one is the LLM on the top. Um, and those are frozen. So we don't we don't fine tune any of these, but we fine tune the intermediary, um, which is relatively small in comparison. Um, and it turns out this is you know giving you a bunch of state of the art results um, in some of the held out test data sets. So the results are pretty good. Um, but I'm not going to really talk into too much details in those work. I think those are uh, great work. Those are interesting work. Um, but, uh, you know, from an algorithmic perspective, perhaps they're not uh, the most surprising. Um, so I want to talk to you about things that I find, you know, scientifically I find inspiring myself. Um, so 
uh, and they're, they're kind of related to two challenges uh, that uh, are related to the, the large language models. And one is that because they're so big, uh, it's kind of hard to fine tune them or train them. Um, another one is because their size is also difficult to deploy them um, and do, to do the compute, right? To handle like billions of requests because that there's a lot of compute. Um, so, uh, and then we, our work in some ways try to, you know, uh, partially uh, solve or help with these problems. So the first one I want to talk about is how do we acquire uh, multi-model capabilities without fine-tuning like the large language model or fine, pretty much fine-tuning anything. Okay. So uh, and we we take uh, video question answering as a uh, application domain. So video question answering, uh, just in case, uh, is uh, the, the problem is formulated this way. You have a picture and you have a question, and you're supposed to look at the picture and answer the question. And so this is kind of really free form. You can ask anything you want. So, um, you know, it, it really requires a lot of different vision and language understanding capabilities, such as understanding what objects are there, uh, understanding the spatial relations, uh, having some common sense, you know, what are these people doing, or trying to catch some free stuff. So um, that's the task. And uh, what we wanted to do is we wanted to connect a bunch of pre-trained pre -trained models. Uh, and conventional wisdom says, if you want to do that, um, typically you need some kind of end-to-end -end training uh, because those models kind of are trained separately and they don't talk to each other, you know, like shared feature space. So in order to do that, you have to do end-to-end -end training. But we're showing you that we can connect these models using language and some saliency maps uh, without any like feature share feature representation, and we don't have to do any end to end training. So we thought that was interesting, and we can also achieve very high performance. Right? Actually, we outperform uh, DeepMind's Flamingo on zero shot because we two with like way fewer parameters. Um, so. Uh, like what's happening? Um, so we have basically three pre-trained modules. Uh, one we take from the blip paper. And uh, we take two modules. One is known as image question matching module. So the network was pre-trained to determine if a given image and a given text match by another. So it's a binary prediction match or no match. Um, the other one is in, in image captioning module, which basically uh, first divides up the image into a number of patches and create a caption to describe the image. And we also take this unified BQ, unified QA, which is a question answering network that only works on text. So it has been trained on a ton of textual QA data. Uh, so it's really specialized. But it doesn't understand vision at all. Um, so what we have is the following. So first we take the image question matching module. Um, so we take this as a text and this is an input image. And we want to find out like what are the relevant portions of the image that are relevant to this question? Because we know that there's a lot of information in the image and most of the information is not relevant to the question. So we really want to extract the relevant information. And the way we do that is we take the loss, we, we take the, we, we assume the correct prediction is yes, it is a, they are a match. And we take the loss and we compute the gradient and we use that to help us do this network interpretability technique on correct end. Um, so uh, to put it in text, to put it in words, we're basically asking the question, if the network predicts, uh, that the text and the question, the textual question and the image are a match, what are the image patches that would contribute to this prediction? Okay. So that this, this interpretability technique helped us identify the sum of the image patches that would contribute to the prediction that the image and the text match. So um, I don't have the equation here, but the general idea of where cam is that you take the cross attention from the text to the image. 
But it turns out that the tension is rather redundant. So we also want to modify the tension with its gradient with respect to the loss. After you do that, actually works pretty well. Um, so the gradient kind of helps you filter out the redundant and relevant part of the tension because if it's redundant, no matter how you change it, you know, the loss is not going to change very much. So the sensitivity to change is basically the gradient. So, so that's how you identify the patches. And after we have those patches, uh, we want to describe them using image captioning. Uh, but uh, we know that the captions are, there are many ways to describe the same patches. And some descriptions are more informative than others. Um, so we wanted to create a diverse set of captions that really describe different aspects of the same patches. So the way we do that is we take those relevant patches, we do some sampling, do some random sampling, and we feed uh, only a subset of the sample uh, patches to the image capturing module. So that the, and there are also, you know, stochastic decoding, some sampling strategy in the uh, tokens generated by the capturing module. So we don't always have the same capture. In fact, we really try to have very diverse capture. Uh, and we capture a bunch of these. So we have a bunch of capture. And after that, we feed these captions and the question to the spectral module that has no, no knowledge or no capability to see the image at all, other than through uh, the captions. Right? But this module has been really specialized for text cuba. We really can do text cuba. So it actually does this pretty well. Um, and hopefully this gives you the right answer. So some uh, uh, qualitative examples uh, where we can see the highlighted portions are uh, considered as relevant to the question. Um, and it turns out to work fairly well. Um, it is really capable of identifying like uh, the type of photo, like you know, this, this portion of viewing. Um, so, uh, and the, the, the captions, we generate are not always grammatically correct, uh, but uh, it's kind of okay. The network is kind of robust enough to handle that. And one thing is that one important thing is that we contain the right answer. And once they do that, there's a high, there's a high, high chance the actual network is able to pick that up. Um, so uh, this is kind of the performance comparison. Um, Flamingo uh, is here. Uh, or you know, from three billion to eighty billion, and they use very expensive end-to-end -end training. They have a huge data set to perform end-to-end -end training. Uh, it's still zero shot because they didn't uh, fine tune on uh, AQA, but they have this image captioning and stuff. So they they have uh, trained a lot, and we did it, um, and we still do very well. Actually, we were doing better than their best result on uh, AQA V two. Uh, we're not doing so well on OKVQA, which is a um, VQA data set that requires external knowledge. So they would ask you if the image shows a giraffe, uh, the question would ask you, like, what kind of food this animal eats? Um, so you, you cannot really get that directly from reading, looking at the image. Uh, so that's where I think uh, uh, a large language model kind of helps. Uh, and fine tuning would further, I guess, open up the treasure box. Uh, but we didn't really have that, so this is sort of not so fast. Um, and uh, um, a little speculative here, right? So, uh, uh, you know, in cognitive science, people have been talking about modularity of the mind, the idea being like the perceptual systems are uh, largely modular and they you cannot really control them, um, and they're effortless, they're automatic. Uh, and you cannot control what you see. Uh, for example, uh, there are many optical illusions, like this one, like, you know, the two squares A and B are of the same color, uh, but it's actually very difficult to see them at the same color, even if you know for sure they're the same color, right? So if you only look at this, there's no way I can see them as the same color. Um, so, so the argument is that those are encapsulated external intervention uh, of your own like free will doesn't penetrate. Um, so, so that's sort of supposed to be demonstration of modularity of your mind. Um, and in machine learning, we don't think 
We often don't think about modularity. We think end-to-end -end training is the best way to do things. Uh, but why is that? There's, there seems to be some conflict between the two ideas. That's my answerable model thinking at work. Um, so maybe there's, so my, my own explanation is that modularity uh, makes sense only when those modules become really, really big. So when it become big, two things happen. Number one, it's very hard to fine tune them end to end. So maybe you just kind of afford to. Number two is that they begin to share kind of an intermediate uh, representation like language. Like they both understand language. So then you can communicate using language uh, without necessarily um, you know, doing this end to end thing. But that's that's a mess. Anyway, um, so so you would be right to point out that I kind of exaggerated a little bit because I promised you that this is going to be about LLMs, and all I did is a specialized QA model. So it's natural to ask, what if you remove the specialized text for QA model and replace that with an LLM? So that's the follow-up work we did. Um, it turns out that if you if you use a textual network that's not aware of the QA task, uh, we really need to demonstrate the QA task to the language model in order for it to work well. Um, so that's what we did. Uh, then the way we do that is to generate a bunch of synthetic question answers, uh, question answer pairs uh, from uh, the captions that we generate. And we include them into the prompt. Right? So those are the input to the large language model. Uh, so they sort of two purposes. Number one, they also tell the network what's in the image. And two, uh, they demonstrate the QA format. Um, so, uh, what we do is we, we generate those captions as we did before, and we use, uh, we pick out some words based on their parts of speech that are plausibly answers to some kind of questions. So those are nouns, verbs, adjectives, and numbers. Um, and we actually fine tune the T5 model to generate questions from answers. And, uh, uh or we can use some templates. We try, we try both. Uh, so the results, uh, if you can put them together, uh, this is doing okay. This is not as good as a special language QA model, um, but it's still doing better than Flamingo, which is something. And it's, there is a significant improvement on the okv 2 a which is the task that requires external knowledge. And as I was saying, you know, trans the large language model has a lot of knowledge in it. So that probably helps. Um, and the, the other strength of this is that you're no longer relying on a single QA model. Um, you can really switch to different LLMs as new models come up. So we tried different things with, uh, from 2.7 billion uh, to OBD 175 billion. Um, and you see the trend is that performance keeps going up. That's amazing. Uh, okay, so that is about uh, um, so the second thing I want to talk about a little bit is kind of in the pure NLP domain, um, which is about how do we simplify the deployment of large models or um, anything we can do about that. Um, so uh, we have uh, we have saw what we have kind of falls in here, which is you know you have some. Uh, manual engineering prompt. Um, this is like one end of the spectrum. At the other end, you can fine tune everything. Um, this is the other end, and which is like middle of GPT. Um, well, in the middle, you have prompt tuning, which is that the model itself can be frozen, but you will prepend or append or somewhere you insert some uh, vectors that are learnable. Um, and uh, those are called soft prompts. Um, and uh, uh, so those are trained when the model itself stays frozen. And the strength of that is that it simplifies deployment. So if you were to uh, fine tune every model on the specific task, that typically gives you better performance than zero shot. Uh, but if you do that, you end up with a lot of models. And if you want to serve these on the web, uh, you know, you have to really worry about like which, how many servers do we 
allocate to each model, and there's some dynamic load balancing, and it's just complicated. Um, so if you have one model that you can serve, uh, that's good. And then all you need to do is to kind of switch out the uh, input, and that will specialize the model for different tasks. So that simplifies uh, prompt tuning or deployment. So the one drawback though, is that prompt tuning requires a large number of training examples. Uh, so if performance drops, if you don't have as, as many examples. Um, so we're really asking if we can improve the sample efficiency of this path, of this uh, way of this paradigm of training uh, or specializing models. So previously people have shown that you could uh, do some transformer, basically. You could fine tune the prompt on domain A, which is similar to domain B, but not exactly the same. And then you transfer that uh, to domain B, and maybe you do a few shot fine tuning, or if you don't have any data, you just do a zero shot. And it kind of works um, somewhat. But we're saying maybe if you assume that you have a bunch of unlabeled data set, the uh, unlabeled data point in domain B, you have a small number of labeled data points in domain B, or maybe no labeled data in domain B. Uh, but if you have some unlabeled data, you could use that to improve uh, this process and learn a soft prompt. And maybe you can then perform few shot fine tuning or zero shot directly on the uh, feed. So how do we do that? Uh, so there are two intuitions. Uh, intuition number one is that it's actually very easy to overfit to domain A, because domain A has label, and he doesn't have label. Um, so we need to apply some kind of regularization and the particular form of regularization we perform is um, kind of on the smoothness of the decision boundary uh, or uh, uh, using, using some form of matter of server training. Um, just to refresh our memories a little bit, um, the idea of matter of server training is to uh, make the model resistant to small changes or small perturbations in the input that are designed to flip the predictions of the network. So, if this is your original input, triangles and squares, and you wanted to perturb this a little bit so that it goes to the other side of the decision boundary. If your decision boundary is a solid line, then you need to like move it at least by B. If your decision boundary is a solid line or a dashed line, you need to move it by A. And so the dashed line is less smooth, and therefore it is easier to attack, to, to create a perturbation to flip the decision. So um, if we can make the network more robust, um, more resistant to this kind of perturbation, then naturally it will give you more smooth decision boxes. Uh, so that's the basic idea of our server training. We have the input X, Y, and we want to create a perturbation that causes the network to flip its prediction, that's delta, and we add new data points, X plus delta, and then Y, there's a pointer so that people can see. So we have this new um, um, data point x plus delta, and the label stays the same. Right? So we want to predict the correct label. After you do this training, the network becomes robust to delta. So that's supposed to like give you a smooth decision boundary. Uh, in some, you could, in some ways, you can see that as also as Gaussian field region, so called data density. Uh, the little things that are more or less the same. Um, so, uh, intuition number two is that we only care about the smoothness of the decision boundary when the two domains are similar, um, which is on the top. Right? So, here we have the orange and the blue domains, and they are similar. Uh, and here, the solid line obviously works better than the uh, dashed line. But then, if they're very different, here are the orange and the uh, blue have very different distributions. And in this case, it really doesn't matter if you have a smooth or non smooth decision boundary. You know, we really don't have much guarantees. So, uh, so we wanted to, what we ended up wanting to do is to learn a perturbation that could make those things, the source and the target, similar. And if we could do that, we would be in the region where uh, those two are similar. Those are very different than your smart perturbation wouldn't be able to contemplate the two. 
Um, so that's kind of the general idea. And uh, uh, so this is really the formulation we have. So the first step is to find the perturbation delta. And the delta has two losses uh, or two uh, fitness functions we're trying to really maximize. Uh, the first one is that uh, we have an adversarial discriminator whose job is to say, is this input Excuse me. Is this input coming from the source domain or the target domain? Um, after you perturb it, supposedly you shouldn't be able to tell or should predict the wrong thing. Second one is if you take the original, uh, this is kind of the, the domain specific classifier of the task, um, and that should create a maximum change in the model prediction, um, which is measured by the KL divergence. Okay, so, uh, and after you get the delta, you uh, add it to uh, the, the, the input x. Um, so, uh, and this is the prompt, and prompt to try to minimize uh, both the source domain uh, specific prediction loss and the changes in the prediction that is caused by uh, the perturbation. So this is being robust to the perturbation. And this is basically doing a straw. Whatever it's supposed to do, uh, it could be a, a, a classification, no matter what kind of classification, you're supposed to just do that from source domain. So after that, you just learn uh, the software. So we uh, iteratively uh, do this a few times, or several many epochs, really. Uh, so uh, the results are actually pretty good. So we compare against a bunch of triangle learning baselines uh, for prompt tuning. Uh, so these are kind of state of the art at that time. Um, and this is the last one is ours. We performed pretty well. And it's interesting to see that uh, some of these uh, networks actually doesn't, there are some tasks where, uh, for example, I think, wait a minute, there's something. Yeah. So prompt tuning, uh, this is PT. Uh, Sometimes they don't work so well. Like they, this, they can become worse than if you don't fine tune at all. If you don't have log twenty data, like here, and they also have large variance. Uh, so, so this is what happens uh, sometimes when you have you don't you don't have a lot of training data. Um, prompt tuning doesn't work. Yeah. Oh yeah, sorry about that. So uh, QQP and uh, MRPC are paraphrasing paraphrase. So given two texts, uh, you're supposed to tell if they are, have identical meaning or not. It's a distribution. It's a classification. Uh, mainly and similarly, those are, um, what was the right name for that? Um, entailment. Uh, so uh, given two pieces of text, you're supposed to uh, indicate if A entails B or A implies B or A contradicts B or they have no relation, it's neutral. Three class classification. Uh, I think SIC and CB are also in the same way. So those are the two types of tasks we're thinking about. Um, okay, and in some cases, you know, like prompt tuning is worse than frozen, like not tuning at all. And we achieve the best results throughout these transfer settings. But transfer typically is better than not transfer. Um, and those are few shot results. And we're also doing, we're also trying to do a zero shot. And uh, again, uh, without any fine tuning on the source domain, uh, sorry, on the target domain. And again, we can achieve very good results. Uh, so that's that. Um, so uh, I have a few minutes left. So let me go through very quickly. Um, so another thing that I guess. Another question I get a lot is like, what kind of research do you want to do uh, in the age of LLMs? Because a lot of the tasks seem to have been at least or semi-solved, or at least like the room for improvement is not very high. So uh, I would say that you know you would need to work on uh, at least this is my opinion. You would want to work on something that requires a lot of semantics, and those are still pretty hard those LLMs. So we created a data set 
uh, that says uh, that are basically videos from the genre of watch a movie in five minutes. Like you have, you might have seen these on YouTube or TikTok or something like that. Um, so it's a very large data set with uh, 800 hours of video. Um, so it's a very, we, we try to argue that this is really a good data set for studying storytelling behavior for a few reasons. Number one, they have events at the right granularity. Um, so you could really describe stories consist of a lot of events, but you could describe them at a very abstract level or at a very detailed level. You could say, I'm walking, or you could say, I'm putting one foot in front of another, and one is more, one is easier for understanding, the other is more difficult. So uh, we argue this is the right granularity. Uh, we have a lot of mental state descriptions, which is what people look for in understanding stories, uh, but it's actually very hard to understand uh, by, you know, those uh, large uh, vision language models. And there's some interesting systematic gaps between modalities due to the storytelling techniques that they're using. So this is one of the storytelling techniques, um, symbolism. So this is from Harry Potter, uh, and Umbridge is becoming the new hat mistress. Uh, and there's nothing in the image that indicates that, other than if you look at the chair or maybe the posture uh, she sits. So, so the chair kind of is a symbol of power, right? It's just kind of a headmaster's chair or something like that. Um, so, so that's the subtlety that you need to understand. Um, another thing is uh, the animation of an obvious cause and effect. So, stories is often about cause and effect. One thing leads to another, which leads to another, and so on. So, um, and as we are so uh, good at understanding these things from our daily life, it's kind of boring to explicitly say those things. Instead, the storytellers uh, really shows one thing and tells the other. So, uh, the, what's shown here is this woman takes a gun and uh, shoots somebody, um, but the text says the woman kills somebody. Right? So, uh, this is really the cause, and this is the effect. Um, the not the next one needs to understand some of that in order to understand that they, these two match. Um, and there are some more. So, for the sake of time, I'm going to skip forward a little. Um, so, uh, we we try to estimate how much gap there is between the two modalities, and uh, you could have very large gap, meaning they're really not talking about the same things, or you can have small gap. I think this is kind of a uh, inaccurate estimates um, because the LSMDC data set is a data set collected uh, specifically for cat form captions designed for people who are visually impaired, people who cannot see. So they are meticulously detailed and they are extremely faithful to the imagery of the movies. Uh, so the gap is actually very, very small, but due to you know our technique, we cannot detect we have a sensitivity issue, so we kind of detect something as, as tiny, um, so we become a little overly sensitive. So I think that this number is actually close to zero, whereas we have kind of a moderate semantic gap. Uh, that is a challenge to uh, the best LIMs that's out there um, that we tested out. Uh, those things actually really don't work. Um, I don't have the numbers here, but uh, those really don't work. Uh, whereas we have some networks that Kind of a reasonably works. Uh, it's not a very high number, uh, but it's better than the baseline. Anyhow, so uh, coming to the conclusions, um, we have seen some large language models. Those are pretty powerful and interesting, and posing interesting questions and asking us to rethink the relationship between uh, machine intelligence and human intelligence. We have designed some systems that uh, try to exploit some of the new capabilities and try to. Um, either solve or uh, help uh, with the challenges they pose. And finally, we have a new data set that gives you some uh, new challenges and hopefully, you know, uh, would be something interesting to work on. Okay. And with that, I want to thank uh, my group of very talented and uh, helpful uh, collaborators, and I'm happy to take any questions.
<clears throat> what do you think makes video so hard to, um, you know, get good accuracy? Makes video so hard to, like, just get good performance. I think you're showing, like, the second last slide was, oh. like, it was oh. very hard to do very well, right? It's not that videos are hard, uh, but it's the task. Um, because of the storytelling techniques, like humans have no problem understanding, but the computers have significant problems. You know, symbolism, something they don't understand. Um, uh, cause and effect is something that's very hard to get on these models. Um, and it's and it's not, and it's it's the mixture of everything together. And if you knew what you were looking for, then you could probably design a prompt and say, you know, what's our symbolism here? In image and the network can give you a bunch but it's you have to be flexible and know exactly what you're looking for um and i think that is hard um so so that's number one. Oh, the task i forgot to explain, explain what the task is which is to just match the video and the text and to tell that this text describes this and or this video is being described at this time. And that even, it's not, it's kind of a surface form understanding, um, but it actually requires a lot of semantics. Uh, so uh, so it's, it appears to be harder than you might think. Yeah. Um, I'm wondering how much is the physics effect of to different uh, use cases. For example, imagine you want to build a kind of multi-model uh, anti-bully system, for example, which is working on um, detection of the hate speech on the voice, on the text, on the video contents, three different, for example, modalities. And each of them definitely could be, uh, could, could use LOM for, for training. I'm, I'm wondering, how this model and the, the, the technique that you presented could be mapped and uh, applied for this kind of applications. Is there any specific limitation that we should consider or um, it is easily extensible to different applications? Uh, are you meant to, is, is to challenge mainly like three modalities? Yeah. Um, yeah, it's a good question. Uh, I personally have not worked in a situation where you have uh, three modalities. Um, I think there are, however, uh, research papers showing that the major challenge is multi-modality, at least one of the challenges is that they don't train at the same speed. Um, so uh, some modalities, uh, like they can learn that very quickly and they can overfit, but others, it takes a long time to uh, overfit. And the, if you can synchronize the two, it becomes better. If you, if they're severely out of sync, they, they become worse. And with the three modalities, I don't only, only imagine the situation becomes worse. Um, so that's something we see as well. And in, in multi-modalities and multi-task learning uh, with Instruct Blue, uh, we're also seeing like, you know, we're doing multi-task learning effectively and those tasks learn at the different different speeds. So uh, if you can synchronize them, things become better. Um, so yeah, so I would say it does, multi-modality does seem to pose its own challenges. Um, and, uh, you know, I don't have like a, like a silver bullet uh, that could solve all the problems. I think it, it probably would require some thinking and tuning and, um, as with deep learning, there's, you know, you want to establish a feedback loop where you do something, you observe the results and try to figure out what happened, what's wrong and then do that over and over again. So it's really like that. Yeah, maybe someone on the back. Yeah. There's a presentation actually that it was, a, it was an active question in my, during the last few months, uh, that is it going to be a new generation of AI that we use instead of using uh, optimization tools, we are using to uh, all, the, all the problems using natural language. Uh, exactly uh, similar to what, what you are doing. But 
Is it similar to uh, restrict our intelligence of our models to the intelligence of the blind person? Uh, because for, for, for an image or for a video, you're trying to uh, translate everything to natural language. Uh, maybe it is similar to. Is this is similar to. Uh, is we're saying is LLM similar to a black person? Yeah. Um, that's a very interesting question. Um, goes back to uh, when I talked about earlier the differences between LLMs and humans. Um, uh, vision obviously is a very important perceptual uh, modality, um, but there's you know we have a lot more. We have hearing, we have touches, we have tastes, and uh, you know um, there is research showing if you are uh, visually impaired at a very young age, your brain will compensate uh, the brain areas for other senses that are large. You become, as you know, the folk theory goes, you become hypersensitive at the other uh, senses. Um, so uh, I think a major drawback of this uh, and the general model for AI is that they don't have a body, they don't have body intelligence. Um, they, you know, if I, there are expressions that we take for granted, a chill down your spine or uh, feel warm by your, by your speech or something like that. Um, and the LM would not understand it or not like, feel it the same way as we understand it. Uh, because we have a body that feels those things. And uh, so, uh, so in body intelligence, I think it's, it's a major thing that cognitive scientists are talking about and it's something that those models definitely don't have. Another thing I think it's uh, interesting is uh, intrinsic motivation. Um, so, uh, you know, we have, uh, if you think about us as creatures that went through like, millions of years of evolution, went through the competition for survival, um, we have the instinct for self preservation because if we didn't, we wouldn't survive this. Our ancestors died long ago. And um, the, the AI doesn't have that. The other world doesn't have that. Okay, so there are some, some uh, thoughts about maybe uh, AI will, will try to kill us all uh, because they wanted to self preserve. Um, but that's, I think, a bit of a mental morphic thinking because I don't think the AI has it. Um, so, so I think the list goes on, and I'm only, these are the things that I can think of, but I think there are probably more. And so the differences are, are big, and I think that uh, it, would take, it would take more time for us to understand what those, this, what those algorithms do, and what are the strengths and weaknesses. Uh, I think it will be a really interesting research direction, and once we understand them well, we will be able to really utilize their strengths to our benefit. So you earlier you mentioned you compared your model with Flamingo, so something very generally multimodally trained uh, from scratch uh, compared to staking some some models together. I was wondering if you think like whether uh, scaling Flamingo further would close in this gap and make these methods obsolete or they will be uh, competitive even in the next few years, like GPT-4 multimodal will kill it or not? Yeah, I think, I think if you have the resources, it's probably that end-to-end -end training is still better. Um, if you have all the data you want, if you have all the compute you want, um, yeah, it's, it's probably it's be better. Uh, but at one point, I think um, there will be diminishing a marginal return. And the economics will say, Perhaps you couldn't do that. Um, so, so that's where I think modular design uh, makes sense. Uh, yeah, but it's yeah, we you know, I, I think at one point the resource constraints will get. Hmm. Yeah, I really like your discussion and also what you discussed now about the general capabilities of AI, AI and what they can't do. I wonder whether you have some, from your experiments, whether you have some conclusions, a case where you were surprised that it was doing better than you expected or worse. Uh, you, you had this 
it's not good at math, it hallucinates a lot, but if you've seen something like this and do experiments or something. Yeah, all the time. Yeah, only like every time we try something, it doesn't work. <laughs> like, like there's a lot of trial and error in our research. Um, and you know, you, you only see me talk about the good results, but before every good result, there are like 10, 20, 30 failures. Um, so, so yeah. Can you give um, an example of what fails? <sighs> Everything fails. <laughs> <laughs> Um, um, so I think writing the prompt is not as easy as I thought at the beginning, especially when it comes to a semantic task. Um, there has a lot of semantics involved instead of just um, surface form. Um, because I, I'm not 100% sure, because I, I asked my students to write the prompt. I thought this is easy peasy. And they came back and tell me, oh, I can't do it. It doesn't work. <laughs> you know? So is writing the prompt, you might mean the network predicting it, or are you writing a manual like just that human, human prompt. Yeah. 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 So, uh, so there's that. Um, so those things are, are more real than you might expect. Uh, and it's my students aren't exactly like native speakers. So they, they struggle a little bit there as well. Uh, so they have some grammatical mistakes. They, they don't describe the task like super precisely. Um, but, you know, also says the models are not very, uh, pretty brittle. Um, so that's why. And, and the, training, the training of the network is obviously um, not easy as you might think, and there's a bunch of skills. And I think the feedback loop is super important is to be able to see the results and make a guess about what went wrong, and go back and change that and see things, things improve. And yeah, and I think that's an art um, that, you know, you have to read papers and recall them at the right moment <laughs> and say, ah, I read this paper this where that's similar to this problem I have. And let me try to apply that technique. Um, yeah, we, I try, I don't think I'm super good at it, but I try. Thanks, yeah, thanks for the insights. Yeah. Just a quick question, so this concept of like prompt, but like how to get the right prompt, it's mostly because we are using these big big models, right? And we just want to web it out with minimal fine tuning. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's why it's <coughs> But I was just wondering, like you also mentioned about memorization and generative capabilities. So I think it also plays a role there because depending upon the way they have memorized their concepts, they over on the prompts, right? Exactly. So it's like embedding spaces and how tightly they are coupled exactly. with, between the different domains or even in just LLMs, right? So is there a way that we can tell, uh, if this also has to play like with, it is also related to the concept of hallucination because of what uh, is, a, is an observation with these LLMs that even if those concepts are wide, like they're very common concepts, uh, like available on internet, even then they hallucinate that like they get the wrong dates, right? For example, Yeah. right? But like, does, does this have to do also with why they are so sensitive to prompts? You know, are these problems interrelated to an extent, like generative versus memorization? Yeah. Um, yeah, I think they're related um, in the sense that um, if you have a very deep understanding of the input, maybe you don't have to memorize so many things. Um, and it's hard to, you know, what they call old model, which is kind of a model of how things work in the world. And if you know that, then you maybe don't have to memorize so many things. Without very coherent and like a, a simple, uh, you know, as physicists just say, you know, you kind of make things simple enough, but no simpler. You want to get to some simple theory that's supposed to account for everything. And the more you do that, the less you need to memorize. Without that, 
then it's become disconnected, right? Like the movement of planets and the movement of objects on Earth are actually governed by the same set of laws, which is obvious to us, but you know, it's kind of a surprising thing. So um, once you get that, you don't have to memorize two set of different phenomena. Without that understanding, you have to say, oh, this, this is how things happen, or this is how things happen in the sky. And, um, and you have to memorize those. Um, so, so I think it's related in that sense. Um, you know, I think the, the hallucination is, a lot of that is related to uh, not having the world model. Like it's gonna give you made up paper titles because it seems to think that paper titles are basically random strings with fancy big words. And we know, like we understand there is a great paper behind it. Somebody wrote it, somebody presented it. And the model doesn't see it like that. So, uh, so it's natural that it'll give you. Um, I think that's what happened. But this is my speculation. So, do take a great thought. Yeah. Uh, so, I guess related to hallucination, <clears throat> um, uh, I think there's this question of like implicit knowledge in these large language models and more explicit knowledge sources like Wikipedia even using like a calculator when you're doing math in algorithms. Um, have you worked on any uh, uh, any tasks or any papers where you've been able to incorporate external knowledge into your model? And uh, I guess, yeah. Uh, yeah, I'm not really working with uh, trying to utilize like knowledge, uh, knowledge graphs uh, into uh, large language models. It's, yeah, I'm not quite up to date in that in that area. Uh, I wonder how much utility there is. But I don't have a very good answer. I think so. So it's interesting to about the semantic gap that you're you're trying to measure between the different data sets. Wondering how that do you have any sense of how it relates to understanding? Right. So if the semantic gap is low, then I guess there's redundancy, and as semantic gap grows. I guess you get more information, but then at a certain point, it's unrelated. So, any thoughts? Well, okay. So, um, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with that. I think, uh, like, yeah, it's basically what you said. <laughs> so, um, if you have, I think a lot of existing uh, visual language data sets are uh, redundant. They really look for um, a close match between the two modalities, and that helps you learn. Right? It's easy to learn. Um, but uh, I think we, it's time that we go out of our comfort zones and tackle some more difficult challenges. I guess, do you know, do you have any sense of how much humans would tolerate? Like if we go to 50%, yeah. our humans won't be able to make sense of the bimodal data, or, or no, will they we, still? No, we can still make sense of it. It's just they talk about the things. Like the CMD data set, what happens is just that you have a 20 minute movie clip, you have one sentence summary. Um, so it just, they're just very different, uh, but you can still understand what you're saying. Um, but when you try to match the two, uh, we didn't do the human experiment to try to you know, match the two. Uh, so the experiment we did was um, we, we take, uh, I'm sure we did do that, um, but I don't have. What we did is that we take a video and want to see if the text is describing the video. So we take the video and we split it into two segments at a scene boundary, or you know, the best approximation is the one we have. And we will ask the human to order the two. So does A come before B or B come before A? And without any text information, they can do it with some accuracy. With additional text information, we can do a different accuracy, and if the accuracy improves, you say, ah, you are using text information to help you, and therefore the text must be describing the ordering of the video. And um, this is basically what we, what we estimate from that. So with CMD, they, they don't, like, the text doesn't help. Uh, 
as AI researchers used to do lots of mathematics because they always have some optimal problems. They needed to uh, convert it to some complex optimization. After deep learning, they need to do programming. Right, language is in quite a bit. Do you think that uh, we are going to have some error that AI researchers need to be able to make prompts talk to models instead of programming the thing? Uh, I'm not 100% sure if I understand the question you're saying. Will prompt kind of replace programming? Yeah, I mean, there's some ways. Yeah, they're training the model just just through the prompts. Yeah, I, I think I think that's we're seeing some of that. Uh, but getting the prompt is hard. It's no, I don't think it's actually less difficult than writing the program in terms of. Well, it this is it. It could be probably be done in a shorter amount of time if you're writing a program that has been written like ten thousand times before. Um, if you're writing like a calculator program that has been written by many different people, or if you were writing like a, um, like some border boilerplate code that's been out there in tons of GitHub repos, um, then you can give it a prompt and those LLMs that are trained on GitHub uh, code bases could just re-give you that, you know, and to pretty good accuracy. And you can run it in most cases it works. Um, if you're the problem happens when you're trying to solve a novel problem uh, with lot without a lot of uh, existing solutions, and then uh, sometimes things don't work. Um, and a downside, another downside of that is uh, you you really need to kind of manually check the code, even if you don't have to write it. Uh, to be aware of potential uh, bugs and in particular security issues. And there has been a particular attack on those programs because uh, sometimes the model hallucinates a library that doesn't exist and tries to import the library. And normally this wouldn't be a problem, but somebody tried to exploit that by putting a very commonly hallucinated library um, on the online repo and they put some malicious code in it. So anybody who is executing uh, this, you know, program written by this LM gets that, right? So, um, yeah, so. Some models that have some elements as the backbone and during a, a, a reinforcement learning algorithm, we can communicate with them just with prompts and get rewards to them just with prompts, and they will be trained. Yeah, I think that'd be a good thing to do. Uh, I, you know, there is a recent paper, uh, best paper, SMAPR, which is using a program and programming language to connect a bunch of visual language modules together. Um, they didn't apply any reinforcement learning, but uh, you could you could definitely imagine doing that. Um, and uh, yeah, I, I think it'd be a nice thing to do. Yeah, it'd be a really interesting thing to do. 